You're listening to an Englishman in the Balkans. It's an Englishman in the Balkans podcast. You know, in the 10 years that this podcast has been going, um, I've been talking about what I would say, and I mean no disrespect to this, the fluffy things of the Balkans. In other words, speaking to people, we're looking at positive stories um, and trying to encourage as many people to find out more about this region, but more importantly, to come and visit this region so they can experience it and get a, a better grasp of it. But like everything else in life, um, not everything is fluffy, not everything is rosy, not everything is good and positive. There's negativity um, all over the place. And so I'm starting the occasional episode now where we're going to talk about things like that. And today, I'd like to ask some questions. I think I know the answers already, but who am I? I've got an expert today. And we're going to find out about independent media in the Balkans. Now, as a backgrounder, some years ago, I was talking on a course in Skopje in North Macedonia. And I came across somebody who I've kept in contact with since. He's a freelance journalist. I think he's still a freelance journalist. He's been involved in a lot of different uh, sorts of investigations and reporting about independent media uh, in the region where he comes from, and in particular, his own uh, home country. And he has um, a project going with another good friend of mine. So that's the full transparency. We're talking today to Boyan Stoikovsky, as I say, at the moment, joining us from Skopje in North Macedonia. Boyan, uh, if you followed the podcast and people say that they've got used to this introduction, I could read your bio, but it would never do it as much justice as you. So who is, this is the first question, who is Boyan Stoikovsky? Uh Thank you, David, for, for this intro. So, yeah, like you said, I mean, I can give a short in, uh, introduction to what I'm currently doing and what I have been doing for the past decade. So, yeah, as you said, uh, I'm a freelance journalist. I'm based uh, here in Skopje, Macedonia. Um, nowadays, m mostly I'm reporting about te technology. So before I was more focused on foreign policy, on business, uh, in the Balkans, but like now, since the past few years, I am uh, mostly covering these uh, tech topics about startups, about the ecosystems from the whole region. And yeah, I mean, let's say if you talk about tech media, it is a part of uh, independent media that we have here in the Balkans. But uh, I can get into more details uh, during the interview. And uh, as far as uh, the rest of the things that I have been doing, so I'm also working with uh, BIRN, the Balkan Investigative Reporting Network. It's also like uh, this is the one web portal that, uh, that is covering the whole region. We are reporting in English there. And we are, it is also a kind of independent media that, that is trying to raise issues on topics that, as you said, are not as fluffy and uh, topics that are also uh, uh, relevant for most of the countries in the Balkan region. How does the historical and the political and the social, how can I say, ecosystems within the Western Balkans impact the establishment of independent media uh, here? I. I think I live in, you might disagree, but I think I live in the most dysfunctional of the countries of the former Yugoslavia in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And you cannot divorce the history, the politics, or, or the, the social culture from anything. And so how, what is the real impact of those three things on independent media, mm -hmm. if at all there is such a thing as independent media uh, here in the region? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, uh, from my experience, uh, when you work for local media, most of the media here, yes, they will proclaim that they are independent, but it's really rarely the case because uh, the political context is very strong here. 
So most media do depend on the support they are getting either from some political parties or political sides or uh, their owners that are businessmen, but they have some connections with uh, politics. And this is uh, most of the time this is the case. And there is, there is basically no way around it. I mean, you might start to want to investigate and write some stories that are, let's say, uh, uh, that uh, want to have an impact on, on uncovering these issues like uh, societal issues or different issues, economic issues in the countries. But then you will most likely stumble upon this block that, that because those issues are either affecting or uh, have a certain type of influence coming from from these large political structures so yeah i mean i would say that there isn't uh, really like independent media when you talk about uh, when we talk mostly about local local media that is uh, established in different countries here i think that uh, there isn't any uh, really strong independent media that is uh, going around and I mean, the context here is yes, politics. Unfortunately, politics gets into everything. Uh, we all hear that, like uh, corruption and all of those issues. But yeah, I mean, it's it's really true. And I mean, the same goes for media as well. I think over the years, media have has become a part of this whole uh, political structure, and uh, it's it's often used by by the politicians and the parties to achieve their their own goals. So yeah, I would say that there isn't really an independent uh, media when you compare it to the Western countries or, or some other places. When, these, when journalists get trained in university, I'm assuming, and I know you should never assume because it makes an ass out of you and me, but let me just assume for the minute that when somebody is learning their craft at university, at faculty, most will have this dream of being an, an independent reporter, you know, doing some good for their society. But when they leave that formal training for their first job, it must be a completely different vision in front of them from what they had dreamt of. What challenges do journalists these days um, face if at all they try to maintain any form of independence? So in, in other words, any form of criticism of what mm -hmm. politicians wish to tolerate. So what are their challenges today? Yeah, uh, as you said, I mean, this was also true, like when I was beginning my my career, you know, in local media, I had this ambition that, uh, you know, you could really like uh, cover these issues that are important for the country, for the citizens. Uh, but yeah, then again, you will, you will stumble uh, sooner or later you know, uh, with these obstacles. Uh, at, at the moment, I mean, I would say that uh, the landscape is changing a bit. So now young people don't really want to become journalists anymore. You know, so this is, I think, uh, one major issue that, that, that is affecting the whole profession because if there isn't anyone that uh, is willing to do the reporting, then uh, what, what can you count on? I mean, the older generations are 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 here but uh, i mean you can't really count on them to support the whole system uh the profession is also uh in most of the countries i think from the region isn't uh, very well paid so this is another obstacle that uh, most journalists most journalists are facing and uh, i had lots of friends uh, throughout my career that uh, started like with me, we went on the same faculty. We uh, started in local media, but uh, most of them, they changed their professions over time. Uh, but as uh, far as the reporting part goes, I mean, yeah, you, you, encounter, you encounter, encounter different type of issues. So uh, if you're reporting on something which is sensitive, uh, then there is no way that uh, you would get access to all of the information that that you're after. Uh, I believe that also, I mean, uh, people are afraid even to report on some topics because they're, they're 
they are scared of the backlash that they are going to get. Uh, because of this, uh, many, peop uh, many people that, that I know have also lost their jobs when they, when they tried to report on something that uh, didn't suit either their, own, their, own, their owners uh, of the media that they were working in or uh, different, different type of uh, structures that, that are behind uh, these media. So, I mean, yeah, these are some of the issues, but uh, I think... Uh, Biggest, biggest one is definitely that there is also like if you're trying to start your your own independent media, then there is definitely the lack of funding. So is it's not so easy to to get financing. It's uh, it's not so easy to to get support. Like uh, if you're if you're trying to go through or organizations or companies within the countries. Uh, the best way I think uh, that you could get this type of support is maybe from international NGOs that, that are supportive of uh, this cause of independent journalism. And this is the best way. But then again, most, most countries here aren't a part of the EU, so it also uh, makes it uh, very difficult to, to get access to like uh, that bigger type of funding. And you just have to rely on whatever you can find. It seems a pretty depressing sort of environment um, for journalists uh, at the moment in the region. In fact, yeah, it is. I, I speak to the occasional journalist here in Bosnia, Herzegovina, um, and they've now got to the point, and I'd like you to, to, to react to this in just a second. It's come to the point where I, I've never been brave enough, courageous enough to say to them, because I don't want to insult them, because I think mm -hmm. at least they're trying, they're in, they're in a, they're in a, they're in a stage of self-censorship now. They don't have to be told what to do. They just refuse to do it, uh, in the first place. So two parts to the next question, uh, boy. And one is how bad is self-censorship becoming in the region? And secondly, at the other end, 180 degrees away from that, um, are there any instances that you particularly know of that we could class as successful independent media projects? Yeah, I mean, uh, when talking about self-censorship, uh, definitely this is this is a big issue. And uh, I believe that, uh, I mean, you can find it uh, elsewhere around the region as well. Serbia, for example, like have lots of colleagues there. I mean, so it's unimagin it's unimaginable there like if you if you even think of some topic that uh, that goes against the government there so i think that we also had this uh, this this issue here I think now uh, maybe not so much as it was the case before with the previous government so i think that uh, the level of freedom is a bit bigger now but still it isn't that uh, that level that uh, we are aspiring to do as a uh, as a part of the EU, as uh, as uh, countries that uh, want to join the EU, uh, because there are certain uh, standards that uh, you know we have to achieve in order to do this. But uh, it it is becoming. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not only becoming, but it 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 has been a big issue. I think during the the past decade. And yeah, uh, almost every journalist, I think, in the region has this type of self-censorship on certain topics. So when you even think about it, you just know that uh, it's, it won't be possible to go there to investigate that type of stories. And uh, so as, as for the second part of your question, well, I believe, yeah, I mean, uh, that one project that I'm doing now, it's, it's with my Bulgarian colleagues and also Romanian colleagues. So we are reporting on technology and innovation in the region. Uh, we are an independent media. So yeah, I mean, here I think I have seen a lot of progress because I'm just guessing that tech is kind of a, this different sphere that uh, doesn't come under this political influences. So here you, you cannot manipulate the tech industry with, uh, with, uh, uh, with this type of uh, interests, you know, like, uh, political and other 
uh, type of spheres. So I believe that yes, I mean it is possible. Like on on some let's say different different subjects, yes, yes, it is definitely possible to go there to do your investigations, to do your reporting. And you can actually see the the positive outcome of it, the positive change that that uh, this is bringing. I mean, with tech, we have seen like lots of companies, lots of startups evolving in the region. Uh, we recently also had a success story from Bosnia as well. This is this uh, this uh, uh, startup called Rola. It's a it's it's a fitness app. It raised uh, quite a bit of money. It was supported also from other investors across the region. So yes, I believe that this type of stories can have an impact and can give some some type of hope for, for the rest in the whole region. I know I heard about uh, the fitness app from Bosnia-Herzegovina and somebody also told me that uh, Croatia is about to explode as far as becoming a leader yeah. in, in the regional um, uh, tech industry. But exactly. digital platforms and the technology that goes with it, it seems to me is harder for governments to control. I mean, a TV station or a radio station, you can drive your car, mm -hmm. you can take your police, you can shut it down. But with a, with tech now, um, with, you know, servers being established in countries outside where that target audience or that tribe of interest is, and that is not so easy. So do you think, and now with your digital reporter hat on, do you think digital and technology could be the savior, maybe not today, but in the future for independent journalism and independent media? Yeah, I mean, you know, certainly I believe in this. Uh, that's why I'm a part of uh, this project here. And uh, we are just uh, trying to to do this type of, uh, let's say, to have this 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 type of impact on on the local media market. We have also seen that uh, how others are reacting. Uh, and yeah, I mean, this this type of reporting, I believe that uh, it uh, can make a change. But only I, I mean, this can only be done if you also have. Uh, journalists that are willing to support this 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 cause you know to learn about uh, this type of reporting about uh, this type of different methods and techniques that are being used and uh, i mean yes i have to admit that not a lot of people that uh, i've known are really like open to learning so this is also one of the issues here like uh, if you're talking about journalism like most uh, people tend to just follow the basics. They don't really want to to go beyond it. Uh, but if we, if we can maybe adopt this mindset and see like uh, what the rest of the world is doing when it comes to digital reporting, uh, you know, you have this all all of the di different formats, different different ways of reaching your audience, and uh, different ways of making an impact. So yes, I I believe that it can become the so we are not only here, I mean, in the Balkans, but on a global level as well. This rolls nicely into uh, the next thing I want to chat to you about is media literacy. Um, from my experience in, in this one country, mm -hmm. uh, in the middle of, of, of the region, it disappoints me so much how many people, how many normal people um, no longer, I don't know whether they ever did, Boyan, but it seems to me they no longer question anything. They'll watch, and I, I'm going to name it today, they watch oh. Happy TV from Serbia, which causes me to want to put my head in the oven and commit suicide. I cannot believe that anybody can watch a TV station with journalists, so-called journalists, offering up TikTok clips yes. as fundamental balanced reporting of a story and then sit there in a studio and have the audacity to back up things that are clearly mm -hmm. 
untrue. For example, yeah, uh, showing something um, that was supposed to be happening in the Ukraine, a military thing, and I said, no, 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 that's, that's over 50 years old. That's from the Vietnam War. Those soldiers are American soldiers. And yet when mm -hmm. you discuss that with people that I know, they say, no, 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 no. It's because you're Western, David. You, you, you don't see the truth. We know the truth. So the level of media literacy, I have to say, is appalling. Um, how can we address that? Is it at all possible mm -hmm. to get some sort of, I don't know, some sort of mindset back into normal people that question things? Otherwise, fake, disinformation, misinformation, it ruins the whole thing, doesn't it? What's the point of having news if it's never going to be true? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, there was also this case with this happy. I remember uh, they used the video clip for one game, I think it was, and they said, oh, this is, this is happening in Ukraine. <laughs> it was so, so funny. I mean, but yeah, like people didn't, didn't really catch up on it. And I'm amazed also, uh, we have also seen like uh, examples here. I mean, you can also see it on uh, social media networks, on, on different platforms. Yeah, like people just, uh, they, they, they don't even question the source, where this comes from. You know, they will just click it, they will read, they will share it, and the damage is already done. Uh, yeah, but yeah, here uh, the uh, the parts is also like uh, I I mean uh, I would put a part of this blame on you know journalists as well because oftentimes it happens even they 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 don't check their their sources so they they will publish something that that is utterly uh, disinformation or uh, fake news and this will go this will go viral and yeah you you have an issue here. So media literacy, I think, uh, definitely, you know, like people, journalists, uh, especially, I mean, if you're calling your, yourself a media professional, you really need to up your game, uh, especially seeing how, how this information is, is basically spreading everywhere. You have it uh, not only on uh, the news, but as you said, on, on different TV shows, on debates, uh, it's uh, trying to uh, affect our lives. I mean, even uh, more and more goes even even deeper on on hey, every level. I would say so. Media literacy. Then, uh, as I as I mentioned before, I think that uh, each of us we need to constantly upgrade our knowledge, our skills to be able to de de detect this this type of disinformation that is uh, coming to us and you always have like i mean for myself it has, it has happened i i've always had like different source, uh, sources reaching out to me uh and uh, you always need to double check you know their stories their background what are their interests over this because uh, often it, it also happens like uh, this and ordinary stores will try to uh, somehow give you this disinformation. They will try to present it as a credible story or credible with with credible data, with credible info. But you you always need to need to check, and you you can never be too sure. I mean, I mean, from the technology aspect, I would say that also now with with AI and with these deep fakes and all of that uh, technology, it, it even makes it even more confusing. So. Uh, the advice that I would, uh, I would give is that, uh, yes, you, you always need to double check or even triple check your sources, the information that you're getting. And this is the only way to s stop this information from spreading uh, even more and more. This is going to be pretty radical, what I'm saying. Do you think it would be beneficial to teach this skill in normal schools, in a normal school curriculum. I mean, when I was a young man, and this is decades ago, um, I always believed back then, and I know that Britain is hardly, you know, to be held up as the shining example, but we always had journalists 
that would do that checking for us. It was assumed. It was a, it was a, it was, it was a given. Now that no longer happens, maybe one of the answers is to teach it in schools. I know that young pe some young people that I've been in contact will turn around and say, oh, what I just saw on TikTok was fake. It's, it's wrong. And when I've said, well, how do you know that? And then they go through this wonderful explanation of how they've self-checked online. So young people are not stupid. They honestly, I think they really do know, not that their mothers and fathers or grandfathers know, but they're starting to check it out themselves. I'm wondering whether we should just leave young people to do that on their own and hope, or maybe for that to be taught in schools. Do you think a silly idea like that might actually work? I think so, yeah. I mean, like I said, like uh, this type of skill is beginning to become a necessity. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, it can become a part of the educational process. And especially for, for this region, I think that, yes, this is very much needed. And uh, it would give the effects that, that uh, can, can, be, can become pretty, pretty important in the long run because as you as you said uh, you can you can not uh, rely on journalists anymore i mean it's becoming very much clear that you cannot be, become dependent on journalists anymore to do this checking for you so this would uh, mean that you are you're creating a whole new generation that are able to to have this type of skill to tell what is uh, what is uh, true from false and yeah it it uh, can have a, it can have a big impact on the, on the countries. Finally, Paul, and earlier on you made mention of the fact that you know to do anything um, involving independent media, you have to be away from government interference if at all possible, um, and governments normally control the money side of things to go to local sponsors or to local uh, supporters. I've always been a firm believer from my experiences in the region that the best people to sort the region out are the people from their region themselves. And sometimes the interference of foreign governments and foreign NGOs can sometimes do more harm than good. But would you say now is not the time for the international community to quit and maybe for more money more resources in in other words hardware training uh and salary support life support if i can use that phrase is it's it's too early i think for the international community to go so how important is that support in your view and to how can people express that support in such a way that gov local governments can't say, here they go again, it's the English getting involved, or here it goes again, it's the Americans sticking their fingers in. How, how do you think we could possibly solve that dilemma? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree that this, this type of support uh, is very much needed. I mean, personally, I had had so this training with Reuters and with uh, different uh, different uh, news outlets, uh, global news outlets that have helped me throughout my career. So I have learned so much uh, about, uh, let's say, digital journalism, new type of technology that, that, that are used in the profession, and basically other courses that, uh, that I am using uh, now in my reporting. So it is uh, quite beneficial. I mean, if there wasn't that type of support, yeah, I mean, I can only imagine, you know, if you just stayed on this uh, local media level and you're just fo following the advices from, from the professionals that are working here. Sometimes uh, these advices were good, but I think that most of the time, no, mu much of the things that uh, is being taught here, it's pretty much outdated. This doesn't change. The curricula also that doesn't really change whether you're, you, you're, you're talking about uh, faculties or institutional uh, organizations that are trying to support media. So I would say that, yes, I mean, the support from 
international organizations is indeed uh, critical to, to to sustain uh, or no, I mean to sustain no, but to to create this uh, new level of uh, independent media that that will properly function and that uh, can really address uh, the issue that, that we talked about before. Uh, on the other hand, yeah, I mean, uh, nowadays, I mean, you, you can also see this with the uh, war in Ukraine. Uh, people are really like starting to react more and more like, oh, the international community is doing this, the international community is doing that. Uh, and this is like how they, they basically justify what Russia is doing in Ukraine, which is uh, crazy from a uh, like, uh, perspective that uh, what all of these countries have been through the past years and everything that has happened. Uh, but the way to go ahead, I mean, to go into the future is just uh, to try to make the most out of the support. If you are really willing to learn and to adapt and to adopt these type of skills and that you can later on, uh, you know, implement them in your profession, in your reporting, in your life as a journalist, uh, I believe, yes, then it is possible to make the best out of it. How do you see the future then? There's you, you've gone through all this, you've battled your way through, you've found you trained yourself, you are very, very well respected in what you're doing. What advice would you give to any young person, whether that is somebody who is watching or listening to this from the region, or even somebody outside the region, that wanted to be a journalist? What advice would you give them? Would you just say maybe... I wouldn't bother it. You're never going to do it. Or, or is it, yeah, get stuck in and, but it's going to be hard. What, what, what sort of tips would you give a young girl or boy that is thinking, yeah, I, I want to do this? Yeah. I mean, definitely, you know, I love my profession. I really, I, I can work hard, uh, up until now and I will continue to do so. So. Uh, that's the key. I mean, uh, from everything that I have been through, I mean, I can say that uh, you you have to work hard. There isn't any way around it, and you 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 have to constantly learn. So upgrade yourself, learn different skills, uh, learn about uh, different different fields, different industries. Uh, I mean, the main mistake that I think that most journalists in the region nowadays are doing it, they're just being focused on one area like foreign policy or politics or, you know, those 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 type of topics. But uh, if you just uh, broaden your horizon a bit, you know, if you're willing to to learn more, to go into different different fields, this will all be this will all prove very much useful for yourself. You will learn a lot, you will meet a lot of contact. And it will it will result in in you like uh, pursuing those story and topics that you that you want to. Well, and thanks, thanks a lot for giving me the time today, today. and your, your excellent overview of the media landscape uh, in the region. I still, after all these decades being here, I still think we can get out of this dark tunnel into the light. But, but I, I think, think it's, it's going to take, take a bit longer than what I initially thought when I first arrived. Well, and thanks, thanks very much indeed. And um, good luck with uh, doing the tech and uh, digital reporting. I'm, I'm following you on Instagram. I try and follow you uh, wherever. And I think what you're doing is absolutely superb. So thanks for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you. Thank you, David, once again. My pleasure to, to be able to share all of my insights and... Thanks again for, you know, covering these topics and diving into, like you said, not as fluffy things in the Balkans. And uh, I agree with you. I mean, maybe we thought that, uh, you know, it would take a while, but no, it's definitely going to take longer to 
be there to get uh, it's uh, get out of the tunnel and just uh, see the light that is out there.